Well, brothers and sisters, the world is filled with worshipers. I mean, every single person in the entire world is a worshiper. Now, that sounds like good news, right? But the problem is not everybody worships something good. But the Bible declares that every single person made in the image of God has a soul that longs to know its creator and is a worshiper. The question is, who or what do you worship? And not everyone is a worshiper of the only one who is worthy to worship, and that is God. Uh, let's just think about what, what do we worship? So, so many people worship sports. Do you know anybody that might worship sports? Uh, in, if you're in school or in your career, many people are slaves to ambition, performance, and achievement. So slaves to it. Some people worship looking good, being in good shape, appearing good. We worship being comfortable. That's a big one for us. I'll wrestle with that. Or being safe, above all else, to be safe. Or having control. Or holding on to your anger. There's still more people even worship money or sex or sexual identity. That's the main thing. Or politics. Or a romantic relationship you place above God. Or friends' approval that you place above God. Or being autonomous from God. Just, I want to be my own boss. What's true for me is truth for me. Above all else, our flesh wants to worship ourselves. And left to ourselves, we worship lots of things above the living God, the only one who deserves that place of worship. And what does God call in his word all of those things that we worship first before him? What's the word he uses for that? Idols, that's right. Do we have idols? Oh, we have lots of idols. John Calvin said, the human heart is an idol factory. Idolatry is the most discussed problem in the Bible. Our series in Exodus today takes us right here. As we come to chapter 32 through 34, would you open your Bibles to Exodus 32 with me? Easy to find again that second book of the Bible, and we're almost to the end. We've been journeying through Exodus almost this entire year so far. If you don't have a bulletin with sermon notes pen, raise your hand if you'd like to get one. Mr. Rager will put one right into your hand. Thanks, Chris. So we enter chapter 32, and God's Word is amazing. We come here every week, and we, we listen to the next passage that God has for us to, to rally around as a church family, and hopefully you're in the Word every day having the same experience. How does the Holy Spirit lead you and us to these passages? Last week, if you were here last week, it was all about God, the, the Almighty God, wanting to be with us, us little frail, sinful humans. How He wants to be with us. It was the design of the tabernacle. He gave Moses the instructions to build the tabernacle up on Mount Sinai while he was up there. And we looked at all the detailed instructions, how they just all work together to proclaim God, the Almighty God, wants to be with you. He wants to dwell with you, and He wants you to dwell with Him. And the tabernacle and then the temple provided that. And as we saw last week, every single detail of the tabernacle, as it turns out, all pointed to Christ. And now, in Christ, after the cross, we become the tabernacle. We become the temple of God. He dwells in us. And that's, that's even better. Well, that was last week. We learned this about God and how valuable we are to Him. And then we come to this week, chapter 32. And we face the reality today that we all fall. We all fall. We all fall sometimes, oftentimes. We all sin. Satan's lies overtake us. Or we slip and we let ourselves go. Or we harden our hearts when things go wrong. Or turn them away from God to all the other things that we pursue. We disbelieve. We rebel. We break commandments. We fall. Today we enter the story of the golden calf 
We've referred to it a few times throughout this series, and we've arrived today. And today, we resonate with this so closely. So God's got to remind us of two things today. One, that He is Almighty God. He is Holy, Almighty, Sovereign God, and we are not. And He's got to remind us of that, that it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But second, He's got to remind us again today that how to be restored and completely revived after we fall. Did you hear that? I hope that you're not daydreaming because I just said after you fall, whether on a micro scale or a macro scale, any type of fall, you can be completely restored after any fall every single time. This is a portion of God's Word that we all need sometimes. Some of you need it right now today. Some of you will need it in a short while in the future. God gives three truths about this in chapters 32 through 34 about falling in sin. First, careful not to fall. But second, rescue when we fall. And third, restoration after we fall. We're going to see Israel in chapter 32 fall so hard and so fast with the golden calf. And if you've ever read the Old Testament, you often ask yourself, why did Israel fall into idolatry after God had done so much for them? Have you ever asked that? The answer is, for the same reasons that we fall, after God's done so much for us. To set the stage, pick up in the verse right before chapter 32, that's chapter 31, verse 18, and this is going to set the stage here. This is how Moses Remember, if you were here last week, he's been up on the mountain with God, communing with God, this mountaintop experience for 40 days, and this is how it ends before we transition here into chapter 32. Verse 18 of 31, he gave, God gave to Moses when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Wow, what a treasure. So he's loaded with these tablets that's got God's finger wrote the Ten Commandments on them. He takes them, and he's ready to head back down to the people. Now, what's going on at the, at the encampment at the bottom of, of the mountain during all of this time Moses had with God? Well, chapter 32 picks up with what the people have been doing towards the end of that 40 days that Moses has been gone. Their hearts falling into sin. Big time. Let's read the first few verses of chapter 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, so this is a mob that gathered themselves together to come to Aaron, Moses' brother, the priest. And they demanded, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron buckled under the pressure of the mob. Verse 2, so Aaron said to them, he buckled. Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. And so all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand and did what they wanted and fashioned it with a graving tool, and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Let's stop right there and just notice how sin works. We do not like being told what to do. After all that God did, and, and all the worship that they had given him, they have had some great moments. Their hearts still craved what their flesh wanted. Be aware of that. And particularly what they craved was what they were used to before they started worshiping God. We talked about that. It's been kind of a theme as well, that God was more concerned, more than getting the people out of Egypt, he was concerned with getting Egypt out of the people. We resonate with that. He wants our hearts but what they craved, more than anything right there, what they wanted was the idols that they worshipped before God back in Egypt. 
The golden calf, as we study Egyptian history, was modeled after the gods Apis, Hathor, and Isis, the Egyptian bull god and goddesses of sex and fertility. Here's a picture. If you remember the ten plagues, each of the ten plagues hammered specifically a set of Egypt's gods that they worshipped rather than the one true god. In this case, it was the god of sex and fertility. They worshipped the golden calf and did their partying and, um, with that as its figurehead. Let's look closely at their sin and fall, verses 5 and 6. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. What, what's he up to exactly? And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And, and we just don't know if he wanted to return their hearts to worship the Lord or if he was just still buckling under the pressure of the mob and setting, setting them up to do this. Here's what they did, verse 6. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings. The offerings were supposed to give to God and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and then rose up to play. And as we study the context and those words, they did not rise up to play volleyball at the church picnic. That's not what they rose up to play. This is an expression that they ate the food sacrificed to the idol, and then it got worse. They got drunk, and they rose up and had a drunken orgy of sex, nakedness, and violence. Here's a picture from the great Cecil B. DeMille movie, The Ten Commandments. How many people have seen that? Okay, so I, I haven't actually seen it. I've seen clips and pictures, and, and uh, I actually watched this scene just to see how closely he captured it. And honestly, he does a pretty good job, the movie maker, uh, for 1958. There's a lot of revelry involved in this worship of the golden calf. This is what they were used to and what they turned to. Reality, honestly, would have been more like pornography. It would have been something that we still wouldn't show in our movies. This is a scene of incredible evil, and the Bible identifies that throughout its pages. Those who have so recently vowed to keep God's commandments, they said, we will do everything you say, God. But when the, the going got tough and they were on their own, left to their flesh's devices, they blatantly violated God's law. This is the same behavior which caused God's judgment on Egypt and the same behavior of the Canaanites who currently inhabit the promised land that they're about to expel because of this behavior. And here they are doing it right here. Wow, how could they do that? Let me ask you, are we any different? Are we any different? How many of you have ever dreaded, you know, I hope in heaven they don't play a movie of every second of my private life. Has anybody ever had that fear? I don't think that's going to happen. In heaven. I'm, I'm reasonably sure. I'm, I'm positive that's not going to happen. But what if we did? What if we played a movie right now and all watched every secret moment and thought in your head and moment of your private life? Is it going to be much different than this? Well, let me tell you, the, the stats on pornography and divorce and substance abuse and abortion in the church and the breaking of virtually every other commandment so that we can worship ourselves shows that we have the exact same struggles. And we do. We have very, very powerful enemies. They did things their way rather than God's way. Here's what they did. They did what was popular. We struggle Choosing God over what's popular. They did what was exciting and stimulating and felt good. And they did what the world told them was good instead of what God told them is good. And we have those exact same struggles today. And we need to be real about that as we enter God's word and his message of hope today. And to further complicate things, their ministry leader accommodated their sin. And far too many church leaders today are doing the same things in our nation. Well, God has done so much for us, and we have worshipped him a lot in our lives. However, we just need to be aware and acknowledge this, that we can still fall any time, any day. We have to be constantly vigilant, constantly fellowshipping with God and with each other. And God gives us the message that we need today for this very time that we'll face many times in our lives. 
This is a testimony to the strength of our enemies. The flesh's desires, boy, those are strong. The world's influence, very, very strong. And then the devil's lies to trick and manipulate our flesh and the influence that the world has on us. We must keep constantly watchful and spiritually disciplined lest we fall. That's the first point. Careful not to fall. Let's see how God and Moses responded here in verses 7 through 10. They're going to tell us how they really feel about it. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I have commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. That just means proud, filled with pride. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. The people had the fullness of God's wrath on them. I will destroy them, God said to Moses, and start over with you. That's the sinfulness of our sin. But the story doesn't end there, gladly. And so I just want to ask you right now, as we continue the story to see the message of hope, what happens when we fall into sin? Now, I want you to really think about this. What happens when we fall so hard and so, so far into sin? Are we doomed, doomed with no chance of ever being restored? In a room this size, I know that some of you have thought that or are thinking that right now. I can never be forgiven. I can never be restored. God's about to tell you that is not true. You absolutely can be fully restored, and he's going to show us how with these people who have sinned so bad and fallen so hard. No matter what, we are never, ever beyond hope. Never. No one is. Brothers and sisters, hear this because you're going to need it someday, or maybe you need this right now. God says first to be careful not to fall. Be careful not to fall. But, point two, when we do, there is rescue when we fall. There is rescue when we fall, and he's going to unfold right in his word exactly how that looks. And it first starts with the, the same place everything starts. Wait, I keep preaching the word, and I keep seeing this. It starts with what? What does everything start with? Prayer, every time. Prayer. Look what happens first. The first thing we see is the power of intercession. Immediately right after that statement, my wrath is burning, I'm going to destroy those people, the next words are, verse 11, but Moses interceded with the Lord his God. Starts with prayer every time. Intercession is a prayer where somebody's in trouble and I'm going to help. I'm going to help by my prayers. I'm going to intercede for them. Moses does that. Watch the power of prayer unfold right here before our eyes. And notice something else that's really critical here. What we're going to see for the rest of our text today is a conversation between Moses and God. And we get a great glimpse at something that's really, really important and special. Just a couple nights ago, our family was praying our goodnight prayers. And I asked, hey, when we pray together, how many sides of the conversation do we hear? And they all got it right. One, and it's kind of, you know, kind of sad. We, we really wish we could see God face to face and talk to him and hear back from him. And we will in heaven when we're glorified and the sin nature is gone and we can stand before his presence. And that would be great. But right now, what he does is he gives a glimpse, a full picture of a conversation of prayer in his word. And for the rest of our text today, just look at this and enjoy this. We're hearing both sides of a conversation in prayer. Let's see what that looks like when we pray. This is what it looks like. This is a humble crying out prayer for an otherwise doomed people. Here's what Moses said. Moses interceded with the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? He's crying out. Why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power, with a mighty hand? Verse 13, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants. 
to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. He's praying, he's crying, he's, he's, remember your promises, O God. He's, he's crying out to him and, and the Lord answers. Verse 14, and the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. So here is insight into our relationship with God. He wants our hearts. He had Moses' heart, and he works on behalf of our prayers. He heard Moses' passionate prayers. He moved on them. He did not destroy his people as they deserved. The Bible teaches that God is completely sovereign and in control of every detail. He's God. But it also teaches simultaneously that we have a relationship with, with him. He's granted in his economy a working relationship with him. And our prayers not only have some power, they're the most powerful things we have because they make God move and God can do anything. This is what he has ble- allowed us. And it's one of the greatest blessings of joy that we possibly have. And it is the greatest force of power in spiritual battle to talk to God, to pray and in it, he, he grows us, and we know him better, and he moves on our behalf and others' behalf. So it begins with prayer, and we didn't, you know, orchestrate this. The Holy Spirit orchestrated this, but we have this very chance to do this today as a church family in our concert of prayer for our summer outreach events. It's right after the service. We're going to go, if you can stay, and eat a quick lunch in the fellowship hall and come right back here and pray and intercede for the people in the Warsaw area and anywhere else that we'll pray and that we can touch who are presently standing condemned in their sins and who have not been set free from those sins and given new spiritual life through Jesus Christ. The one way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. We're the light in the world and it starts with prayer. We get to do that today, this very day, to intercede on behalf of the people around us that we love and know. Prayer is where our rescue begins, but that's not all there is to it, or else we'd just do nothing but pray all day. There is more. So the next step we see is the power of repenting, not minimizing sin. We pray, we intercede, we ask God for things, we worship him. It goes on to repenting for sin, not not minimizing sin. Here's a, here's a statement, an expression we need to keep in mind, and that is that God will lift up those who are on their knees and he will strike down those who stand in pride against him. Which one do you want to be? He will lift up those on their knees. He will strike down those who stand in pride against him. Let's see what happens. Moses, just after he prayed for them, is going to walk in on them in the middle of their sin And the series of events now from verses 15 through 29 just show how sinful our sins really are, how serious our sinfulness is. Let's look at verses 15 through 24. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, going to check out what is going on. Tablets that were written on both sides. Verse 17, when Joshua, who met him halfway down the mountain, Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted. He said to Moses, listen, there's a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing, I hear. Hmm, what is going on? Well, they keep walking and they turn the corner. Verse 19, as soon as he came near to the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf to see this. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it into powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. He was fired up, wasn't he? And that's what you call righteous indignation. And it's a thing, and it's a thing that we need to have a little bit more of ourselves. Then as you scan these next verses, Moses had to confront the soft leader, Aaron, who had accommodated the people's sin, and he does. And at first, Aaron makes excuses and blame shifts and minimizes sin. And, and see, that's the caution here. Don't blame shift and make excuses 
and minimize the sin. No, own it. This is repentance. That's our first response usually. That's our flesh response. Let's know this about ourselves. We will get defensive, minimize our sin, blame shift, and make excuses. Be prepared now to work past that. And what Aaron does, he comes around and he repents, which is great news. And he comes to do what God told Moses and Aaron to do. And this is pretty severe. He says, go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make judgment right now against the leaders of this mob who caused all this trouble. Aaron, get all the Levites, that's the tribe of priests, strap swords on your side, and you're going to go and strike down all the people who led this mob. And 3,000 people were struck down that day. What the Bible teaches throughout is that those who have committed themselves to rebel against God and lead others to do the same and not repent must be cut off. This is what the Bible teaches throughout when it says that we stand condemned in our sins already until we repent and trust Jesus. Repentance is the key. It's to turn away from the things, from the idols that you're worshiping other than God, from the sin in your hearts. To turn away from that, that's repenting. Now, we are not slaying pagans with swords here at Community Grace. It's, we don't have that ministry. We're not going to launch that anytime soon. And that's a, good, that's a good thing. But with that same level of intensity, we are fighting for purity and for the spiritual health of ourselves, our children, our families, our church family, our world, our town. Fighting for the purity which honors Christ our Lord and produces the best existence for every person. One thing we have going on right now is about 35 men are in the Conquer series, which has is its design is to forge a battle plan for purity in our lives. What an important thing in this world that we live in. It's been so awesome that we're going to launch another round starting in October. Sean's going to lead that one. Already going to do a better job than we're doing this time, trying new things, doing new things. And we're researching the women's version as well, which I've heard a lot of good things about. It's been, it's been amazing. But one of the things that's been made clear through this battle for purity to have, to have your, that part of your life conquered for Christ is that we cannot do it alone. The enemy wants to isolate and separate us, and so does our flesh, and we'll fail every time. We can't conquer and have purity. And so this is why we break up into smaller groups in this Conquer series and why we need to do this. We need to follow a couple more commands right now. If we want to have success in all of this and being restored and revived after a fall, we need to add this right here. Number one, we need to confess our sins. We need to confess our sins to God, 1 John 1, 9. When we confess our sins to God, he's faithful and just to forgive us all sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then take it a step farther to this command, James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. That's the way to have victory. Look at, look at this verse. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. This is the process of being completely revived after a fall, after a fall. And second, we need to be honest and bear each other's burdens. Galatians 6 2 says, Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. And yeah, that seems messy and that seems time consuming to do that with your brothers and sisters in Christ, but it brings great joy as we're restored. So we can't carry, we can't recover from sin alone. It doesn't work. And we need to be in a, in a small group or a discipleship relationship or accountability that works, connected to the church family in some way, bearing each other's burdens. That's what we need to do. That's why we're here. This is God's instruction on how to revive after a fall. And without taking these steps that we're talking about today, we will stay stuck, angry, depressed, and spiraling even further. And I don't want that for anyone here, and I know you don't want that either. So hear God's word. As we pick up in verse 30, Moses knew something else that we need as well. And this is an amazing little section in scripture, the need for a substitute. Right here, right here in these verses, the gospel returns again, once again, in the book of Exodus. Verse 30 says, the next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned, a great sin. You're lost in your sins. You're cut off from God. Look what he says, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make 
atonement for your sin. Moses is still their compassionate mediator. He knew that they deserved God's wrath and death, and so he pulls a move so incredible that it's mind-blowing. He asks if he can die for their, their sin so that they can live. Verse 32, he says, blot me out of your book instead. The need for a substitute. Moses is a picture of Christ so many times in his life. That's how God answers. God answers, no, I will not kill you and I will not blot out all the people but I will blot out those who did not repent by sending a plague. And that's what happened. But this is the pinnacle of this message again. That we deserve God's wrath and death when we're rebelling against him, not receiving Jesus. We have a substitute infinitely greater than Moses. Jesus, who did die in our place. He did. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says he knew no sin, but he took on all of our sin and gave us all of his righteousness. We need a substitute. And we have one. It's only through faith in Jesus that's the most important calling and decision that you'll ever have in your life. And God's calling you to that again today. If you haven't trusted him, today can be the day you do. And I implore you to do it. And let us know so we can rejoice and walk together in this Christian life. So the need for a substitute. But then the story continues, and our story continues as well. In the events, now in chapters 33 and 34, God shows us all that his children can be restored after we fall. Again, God said, careful not to fall. We can avoid a lot of the trouble right up front. Careful not to fall. But when we do, he provides rescue when we fall. And now he gives restoration after we fall. And I'm talking full restoration, friends, is available today. Now, a lot of preachers will stop at chapter 32. There's so much in chapter 32. It can fill more than one sermon. But I just think that's sad because it's missing out on the completion of this process here in verses 33 and 34 complete restoration after the fall. This is where it happens, this complete restoration after the fall. So let's work quickly through these chapters, the details, and draw out the critical things for us today. After we fall in sin, in any level, small, minor, major, ongoing, short time, one moment, relapse, anytime we fall in sin, be assured we can totally be restored to great peace and harmony with God. We can, as we see first here in chapter 33, we can regain God's presence. God's presence has been a huge theme in Exodus. Stay with me now. Remember, we've talked about this before. God is omnipresent, you asked. So isn't he everywhere? Yes, but presence can mean different things. And it does. This kind of presence is to dwell with God, to commune with him, to be forgiven by him, to be filled by him, to hear and be guided and assured and blessed by him and be in worship of him. That's presence with God, and that's us at our absolute finest, walking with God. And that, that can be regained. And here's how. There's some steps here. It starts with repentance again. Yes, this is repeated because it is that, that key. Repent for revival. As of yet, God's presence, a tangible thing in the Old Testament through the cloud during the day and the fire during the night, had not returned yet to Israel. And they feel that lack of God's presence. It had not returned yet. Picking up at verse 33, God tells Moses, You all, okay, go from Mount Sinai, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land, but I will not go up among you. I won't be with you lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. God's presence isn't going to be with them. Oh, what's going to make the difference, though? What's going to make the difference here for them? They were ready to repent now. Verses 4 through 6 says, When the people heard this disastrous word that God won't be with them, they mourned. In the end of verse 6, they stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. They mourned their sin. They were sorry 
They were repenting, and their actions followed their mourning. They followed their, their actions, matched their humbled hearts. I'm sorry for my sins, God. I want your presence back. And there it is. And this is repentance, and it's necessary for revival. And that's exactly what happens next, because God is faithful. He still is today. So we do what they did next, return to worship. Wow, I worship you freely again. Let's see what happens in verses 7 through 11. If you, read, if you have your Bible open, you'll see that this kind of odd little section in the text, Moses goes out to the tent of meeting again outside the camp. Well, what, what, what's going on here? Well, again, and he had just gotten the instructions for the tabernacle, which had the tent of meeting there, the nice permanent ornate one that they're going to build in the tabernacle and then in the temple, but that hadn't been built yet, so he's out here setting up his pop-up tent of meeting. So what he goes and does. So he got his little pop-up tent, and here, here we see what happens. Um, the people's repentant hearts encourages him, their leader, to meet with God, and this encourages the people. Chapter 33, verse 10, and when all the people saw the pillar of cloud returned, standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Just imagine all the tents and all the people seeing the cloud. God's presence is back, and they were worshiping together at the, at the tent door. And you know what this makes me think of? It makes me think of our church camp out weekend next weekend. If you haven't signed up for that, please do come out next weekend. And we're going to stand outside of our tents and campers and worship God. Because guess what? His presence is with us. It's in us. And we're going to be together as we are now. Just like the Israelites worshiping God. But their leaders returned to worship, led the people to return to worship. And that leads to the next thing that happens. The people's next request, God's grace. Request, they ask for his grace. Moses asked for his grace. And once again, we're given this insight into a conversation with God. Notice what Moses requests from God as you scan verses 12 through 17. He says, show me your ways that I may know you and found, find favor in your sight. This nation is your people. No, most notably for us today, Moses requests God's grace, verses 15 through 17. And, he, and God said to him, or no, Moses said to God, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from me. We don't even want to go if your presence won't go with me. So I'm going to ask for your grace. For how shall it be known that I have found favor, that's grace, in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every people, other people, on the face of the earth? Moses asked for grace, and God gave it. Verse 17, and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight. This is the exact exchange that you have with God in your prayers and I know you by name, he says. That is the most intimate relationship. God extends his grace. If you can see God's hand, God extends this grace to you as well. And you're faced with a choice to either reject it and keep pursuing the idols that you used to pursue or to receive that hand of grace and walk with him in a much better way. And receive God's goodness. That's the next point. Moses receives God's grace, and then he goes even further. Look what, he, look what he asks for next, verses 18 and 19. Moses said, please show me your glory. He's asking for a little bit more. Please show me your glory. Verse 19, and he said, God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Again, this is a covenant relationship knowing each other's names, Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. The rest of chapter 33 describes God doing just this by revealing his glory to Moses, re revealing his goodness, his presence directly to Moses in another scene of this close relationship between God and Moses. And all, the point here is that we should request these same things from God. Request to know him, to have his goodness in your life, to have his grace, to see his glory. I've seen this kind of, this kind of relationship with God and, 
various prayer meetings that I've been a part of or having mentors, and maybe you have too. You've seen someone that's been walking with God for so long and knows Him so well and is so anointed by Him and has so much faith, and their prayers always seem to be answered positively, <laughs> and, uh, and you're just inspired by these mature saints who have walked with God. And Lord willing, I have grown towards that direction, and you have too. And that's the journey of the Christian life as it grew further and further into this kind of relationship with God to receive his goodness. And I'm telling you, nobody's perfect. So all of those people have fallen and fallen and fallen, and they've been restored every time, and this is how. So ask for his goodness. Ask to see his glory, to be a part of it, to receive it. We're almost all the way around this, the basis of this whole process of being restored. Let's just review real quick. We have prayed. That's where it all starts. It starts with prayer. We have repented. We have humbled ourselves before God. We have put our faith in our substitute, Jesus Christ. Our faith, our faith is in him. We have humbled ourselves. We have returned to worshiping God above all the other idols. We have requested his grace and we have received his goodness. Oh man, doesn't this feel free? and good to be restored and forgiven and lifted up and loved and known and empowered by God. Now, do you want to see how to get all the way around the bases to home plate? It's in, verse 30, it's in chapter 34. Fully reviving after any fall, to any extent, any time. Here's how it concludes. It finishes. Renew God's covenant. Chapter 34. There's a chapter break between chapter 33 and 34, but the conversation between Moses and God continues. On. At this point in the conversation, that God tells him to make two new stone tablets. He's like, you know, the ones you broke, Moses? You're going to have to make some new ones. So he does. He goes to the shop, and, and he makes the two new, new, two new stone tablets, and then the conversation continues. See how special this relationship with God is as you scan chapter 34. And I'm going to encourage you to, to just meditate on these passages later today or the, throughout this week even more deeply. But in verses 6 and 7, God declares his name again. That's that closeness. And then these verses, verses 6 and 7, become foundational to God's covenant with his people. And these verses are repeated several times throughout the Old Testament, these right here. Let's read them and worship God in them together right now. Not, not out loud, but just know this about what the Lord says. Verses 6 and 7, the Lord passed before him, so we have his presence, and now he's going to renew the covenant fully with his people. The Lord, he's, this is what God says, the Lord, the Lord, he says his name twice, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is God. Keeping steadfast love for thousands. Listen to this. Forgiving iniquity. All of it. And transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty, which means he's entirely just as well. This is a great God. What was Moses' reply? It was to bow down and worship him and pray and talk to God and enjoy him. And then the rest of chapter 34, we see God renews his covenant, fully renews the covenant. They were almost doomed in God's wrath for the rebellion. They've been completely, completely restored. The process again, they have prayed, they have repented, they have put their faith in the substitute. They have humbled themselves. They have returned to worshiping God above all idols. They have requested his grace, and they have received his goodness. And now they have renewed their covenant with God, which is God's exclamation point in his stamp and his seal that we are totally, totally good. You've been restored, forgiven, healed, um, on your way to healing and we say, oh man, doesn't this feel free? Doesn't this feel good? Yes, it does. That is God. May we all have that today and every day, anytime, 
that we ever fall and are separated from him and down and depressed or angry or stuck. God has spoken in his word. Here's just one next step today then is for you, be fully restored with God, whatever that looks like, whatever that takes today. It's different for all of us, but take the steps to revive after your fall and love it and rejoice and rejoice together. Pray a prayer of commitment that you will take these steps and do them as often as you sin. Receive Jesus today for total forgiveness of all sins. If you haven't, write it on your communication card if you do or would like to talk to, to someone more about that. If you've received his salvation but haven't been baptized yet, come to the baptism class next Sunday morning at 9.15 in the gym in a classroom in the gym. That's a command. That's a, with the way we follow Christ. These are important steps. If you need help, again, I've, I've said, the devil wants to isolate us. Don't stay alone. Don't stay isolated. If you need help of any kind, if you need deliverance, if you need counseling, if you need discipleship, if you need support, if you need finances, if you're stuck in any way, if you need forgiveness, whatever it is, seek those connections. And request that help. That's what we're here for. Let's give this all to God and ask that he directs our steps. Lord, we wrap up this uh, pretty incredible section of your narrative that you preserved for all time to speak through, through your Holy Spirit, for this body of people right here in this moment. I pray you'll do your greatest work. I pray that no one leaves here today without grasping and embracing this process that we've learned today. That we go through it and restore our full fellowship and worship of you, peace in life, ability to overcome all circumstances. Or it's by your power, your grace that we do it. Lord, as we give our hearts and worship and return to you now. I pray that you will fill this place with your spirit. In Jesus' powerful name we pray, amen.